Well, wasn't the last session quite exciting and provoking, right? How do we deliver a better experience to make people go to the office? Is there a one-size-fits-it-all universal solution for all, all type, types of companies at all? Why there are not enough phone booths? Those are just a few questions that were asked uh, in the last session. However, however, now we are gonna uh, we're gonna switch the subject of reimagining the physical space to the future of work and creating destinations for benefits of all tenants specifically. This discussion will focus on the benefits of flexible space for all tenants and what are some of the advantages to landlords of working with flexible provider. We will dive deeper into the current trends in optimal tenant experience and much more. And uh, since we have the, the speakers on stage uh, already, I'll just mention the names and I will leave you to say a couple of words about yourself. I think uh, this would be uh, better. So we have Rupert Dean, Will Kinnear, and Natasha Morris here on stage. And we have Mark moderating the, the session. So please. Let's give them a round of applause, please. All right, why they let a yank on stage with uh, three proper Brits, I don't know. Um, but uh, this is the uh, second to last session. We're going to uh, sauce it up a little bit, aren't we? Yeah. All right. Um, all right. Uh, somewhat further introductions. Uh, left to right. Will, kick us off. Um, introduce yourself fully, your firm, what you do, and, and uh, as a preamble to this discussion about creating value for landlords, in, in particular, enabling uh, value for tenant delivery. Just give us an initial setting of the stage. Well, not much, then. Not, not, not much. Um, Will Kinnear, uh, director of Hune and founder of Hune. Um, I'm a charter surveyor, been in the flex space sector for 18 years. I advise uh, property owners, uh, funds, developers, and institutions on their options what they should be looking towards within their specific assets across their portfolio. Um, I also advise prop, uh, operators as well on their expansions, um, how they can work with owners, how they can find property, etc. Uh, but I specialize mostly in partnership arrangements, management agreements, uh, profit share leases. Uh, so my role, I think, if that doesn't give you enough, I think sort of encompasses everything that sits here with an operator side and the landlord side, but then be able to bring in sort of how each, how other, um, owners and investors look at the sector and why, potentially, why they should get involved or why they shouldn't. But to be clear, your customer is the landlord. Landlord or the operator, yeah. depending which side of the fence I sit. Natasha. Um, Natasha Morris, I'm with Landsec. I'm um, their office products lead. Uh, to explain what that is, um, Landsec diversified their office offering into three defined products. We've got Blank Canvas, which is our traditional cate. Uh, product, Mayo, which is our flexible uh, service product, and Customized, which is our fitted product, um, typically for single occupiers, which we can add managed services to as a bolt-on. So I'm here as a landlord and as an operator. Uh, my role is to scale up Mayo and Customized, uh, which shows commitment to this uh, the flex sector. Um, it's definitely a future. Um, yeah, so hopefully I'm here to give an overview of both sides of the fence, really. And Rupert, bring us home. So I'm the, um, the co-founder and CEO of X and Y. Uh, and X and Y is an operator that works with landlords uh, operating across a, a range of amenities mm -hmm. from traditional kind of uh, desks and chairs mm -hmm. to wider amenity. Um, and, um, and basically just really work with them to be able to activate both estates and buildings uh, and uh, I guess execute on their wider vision for the space beyond just desks and chairs. So just, I, I don't know that there's any commercial relationship amongst us. I know you all know each other, but, but just to be clear, <laughs> uh, uh, Will, you might try to coerce Landsec into choosing Rupert to facilitate the creation of great space to serve the audience of professionals looking for flexibility. Yes. Hypothetically. Independent role, right. very much outside of the operators, but understanding how the operators work, what their niche is, how they sit in the marketplace. So it's about bringing the expertise, of, and it, it really is just through years of yeah. doing it, understanding how they work. So several of the earlier panels today spoke about and even cited uh, st uh, recent studies that predict that there might be a massive shortfall in flexible capacity. Might be. 
And of course, the headlines for the better part of the last two years have talked about you know, the explosion or the white hot center of flexibility. So let's start with some fundamentals. Uh, if an argument is being made, Rupert, to an institutional landlord who hasn't yet perhaps taken the leap that a LANSEC has, uh, and so if the argument is being made about the benefits of amenitizing a building or of bringing flexible operations into a multi-tenant building, give us those fundamentals. What's, what's, what's the why? No pun intended. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, so I, I think fundamentally the, 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 the way we pitch it is we say to a landlord that, you know, ultimately you've got to be able to differentiate, differentiate yourself in a very saturated market. Um, there's a lot of offering out there. There's a lot of operational offering. There are a lot of brands. There are a lot of white labels. Uh, how is your building, whether that's a, a class A building or a, or a slightly class B building and below, how is that going to differ uh, from the next? And ultimately, uh, it's about taking out the fact that you're dealing with a flex operator and someone who's dealing with, with a traditional lease tenant and work out in that building how you would activate it and make it a journey for everybody, right? So whereas most people will think introvertedly about just focusing on their, their flex members or tenants, uh, what, what you've actually got to do is think about that wider amenity, right? So let's just talk about things like the arrival. We've all entered into buildings which are just soulless, where somebody's just there with a suit and a tie and doesn't really, frankly, care at all. I was going to swear, but I won't. Um, uh, where, 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 I could break the ice on that, didn't <laughs> yeah. no, we got plenty of time up. And, um, and then where, where do they go? Not everyone weirdly enters uh, the building in the same sort of mood. So where are we going to exercise? Where are we going to brainstorm? Where are we going to drink? Where are we going to meet interesting people? I don't just want to go to my office and see other people. Where can I go for a set, for a set mood? How do I get there? I don't want to fucking see Will. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I hear that a lot. <laughs> don't bring him. Um, and so I think, I think landlords have got to think uh, a little bit differently. Uh, I think gone are the days, potentially, uh, of uh, what people used to refer to, and I quote a landlord that we had, of the imperialist model of uh, creating a building filling it with leases, selling it to a pension fund, and going again with more money. I think people are now have to think a little bit harder, uh, which is why there are a lot more uh, sort of management agreements uh, that are coming to, to the market at the moment. And, um, and I think hopefully it works, and it's becoming a little bit more equitable between landlord, tenant, and operator. And I think that's, that's a, a long-term trend. I hope it's a long-term trend. Will, when you're selling to a landlord, I know, you, I know you work with operators as well as landlords. When you're selling to a landlord, um, uh, will you work with anybody that'll pay you a check, or are you applying some Definitely. judgment? Uh, and, uh, and are you able to gauge and be, be thoughtful about your client, the landlord? Can, are you able to gauge what will actually be required of them to succeed at this? And, and, and what, did, what did Rupert perhaps miss, if anything? That's exactly, I mean, that's exactly my role. Oh, you're one but of the good guys. I, uh, in theory, <laughs> yeah. in theory. Yeah. I mean, it's, I'll work with anybody that will show a check, but in terms of, okay. yeah. if I take it to, to all honesty, we have millions and millions of assets around the UK. Let's look at the UK alone. And we are in a position where the advice they're getting these days is changing all the time. You know, traditional agents who have been the advisors in the past have been saying, you know, we don't need to put tables and chairs in. We've, we've always done Cate Plus, uh, Cate Space. Don't worry about carpet even. Yeah. Broadband wouldn't even think about it. So we're now getting to a stage where I think the biggest point is how you guys and how operators sit in this is that it's how people find space these days, how people actually go about, how occupiers go and find space. And the biggest change is obviously online brokers. And to be with the online brokers, you know, I advise owners that you've got to look at their own asset and say, right, what can you do with that asset? Can you put a flex operator in there? Is there enough space to do that? Have you got the money to do that? Can you enter into a partnership agreement? Or does the way that the fund is set up allow you to do that? Because it might prohibit you from actually taking anything other than the rent. So you've got to be, mm -hmm. I've got to be in a position where I've got all the options at my disposal. But using that, we've then got to work out why you're trying to create this space. It's trying to find occupiers. Let's not forget, all owners want to do is fill the space. For 200 years, they've had complete control. Occupiers have had no control. You know, you want to take my space, you take my space, but you take it the way I want it, with the incentives I want to give, et cetera, or you'll go somewhere else and get the same thing. Now we're in a situation where online brokers hold so much power. If you're looking for office space, do you go to JLL, 
Abbott and Young, Cushman's. I do not. You do not? Be, yeah. But you know, <laughs> from my point of view, it's, it's true. People don't know these names. What they do is type in a line. What comes up is a free brokerage service that says, we'll find you office space. We won't charge you a penny to do so. And we'll take all that hassle away. But all we're going to show you as a broker is everybody that's on my list. So if you're a building owner in this building here, and you're not on that list of broker opportunities, then you'll never find that, see that online client, online, sorry, online uh, mm -hmm. occupier. And more importantly, these are not tenant rep work. So they're not represented. So that broker will not go out to the marketplace and say, hi, I've got a client that wants to look for space. And therefore, everybody with a building can come and say, hey, we've got some space, come here. That broker will keep it quiet because they're not retained by them. So we've got this problem that owners need to see and be visible to online brokers. But therefore, my job is to say, well, actually, what do you need? Flex space, space to service, whatever else it is, to open those doors and allow people in. So Natasha, if, if, if we take this bloke as being sincere and honest, and I, I mean, I've known him for about 45 minutes, and so I, I, I think he's quite honest, yeah. Um, uh, he, he suggested halfway through his answer that when he works with a client, again, I don't think he's a seller no, to landlord. we don't pay him, no. no that um, he's gonna be thinking about the interest of the landlord and, and maybe get to the why, like what, what they're trying to solve for. So Landsec is one of the bold in its class. Yeah. It's, you know, along with other folks like Heinz and Tishman and, and a select cadre that have actually stepped forward and, and put a, a brand out there. Yeah, true. What the heck, we're getting clean now, what the heck were you solving for? What was the why behind Mayo okay. and the other products? Um, what, I mean, get, get honest with us here. What, what problem was Landsec trying to solve? Um, less of a problem to solve and more of a not being left behind. Right. You know, if this is the market that's exploding, okay. Um, if this is the future, or at least a rapidly expanding sector, I don't think you can say you're in the property industry and then ignore what doesn't suit your normal palette. I mean, HMV ignored streaming and, you know, look where they are. I don't know if that translates. Yeah. Um, so it, to an extent, keeping your hat in the ring was a really important part of it. Right. What you learn from, and, and certainly using the resources we have and the knowledge we have as property owners who have been engaging with our customers over time and really understand how they occupy their buildings. We have those relationships and partnerships, as we like to call them, yeah. with the customers and see how they are you know, evolving their spaces and the use of their spaces. It, it, we should be able to use that knowledge and actually deliver good flex. And I'm, I know there's more to it than that, and sure. it's certainly been a learning curve. Um, but I think the other flip side, and it's probably something that we were talking about earlier about why would you have it in your building, is the benefit to our existing customers uh -huh. of having flex in their, yeah. in their same building or on their campus. That was identified too, and actually, that's just magnified now. Post-COVID, um, hybrid working, you know, reducing footprint, trying to outsource some of these business uses into other spaces, and uh, that's yeah, it's been really an important part of it. So that comment, not being left behind, I don't know if that was sanctioned by your colleagues or not, but that that to me sounded yeah. quite. I wasn't. I wasn't here when they thought of Maya, which is well, why I'm allowed I mean, to that, say that, I'm not I mean, in. with all due respect, <laughs> that that sounded very honest and, yeah. and vulnerable. Um, to not be left behind suggests that that the center of gravity is moving somewhere else, or 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 things are changing. There's change afoot. If there was only, you know, flex is not new, as everybody here has said, and lots of people in this right. room have been in it a lot longer than I have. I'm not going to claim to know any better, but it we can't deny it has changed in the way. I don't know anyone was ever involved in student accommodation. It used it's always been there, and then it had its right. boom market. All investors were interested. It's an asset class of its own. Right. I think that Flex is having its market, its day, and it's it's just sort of coming into the mainstream now. If I say to people, people ask me what I do, I yeah. can say, we, "Have you heard of WeWork?" And they kind of got an idea. So suddenly right. at the dinner party, they have a clue. So. Um, there's just a more of an understanding of it. So I think that's part of it. But I, I don't think, I'm not quite saying being left behind in that there will never be a need for what we traditionally have because there will. It's just we're diversifying. And finally, now we're going to offer all of the different products that different companies are going to need on their journey. Yeah. And I think we've exactly going back to two of your points in terms of that. Flex space, by its very nature, was designed to be short term leased. That's really what it was. It was office space the short term is no breakout space. And it goes back to Chris's point that he made earlier on in terms of no one person fits 
all at the moment in terms of how they want to work, where they want to work. Yeah. And the ability to flex and have a product and have a, a building that can be switched on at different times of the day for different, for different people wanting different things is absolutely key. And traditional landlords can't do that. There's just no way that they're set up to do that. Some landlords are flexing and now saying, we need to be able to, excuse the pun, we need to be able to be part of this and be able to offer this to our, but there's not many. What do you mean they can't do it? I mean, Natasha, well, they, you're saying they, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. But, a, but a, lot of them, a lot of them can't do it. A lot of them aren't in the position to do it. They're not set up to do that. They haven't bought on the basis of it. They don't have an asset management team to do it. Some are forward thinking. And exactly, there's, there's, there's so many elements to this that what we can't do is say that every single asset is owned in the same way or run in the same way. Um, um, Get you back in here, Rupert. Um, uh, do you, <laughs> not that you were gone, do, do you think, if uh, Natasha said to you, uh, Rupert, love what you're doing at X plus Y, we've got, we're going big. We don't want to be left behind. We really don't want to be left behind. In fact, we're going to take, how big is your portfolio? 100 million? 50 million? The Landsec, Landsec, Landsec office. Yeah, yeah, 5 million. 5 million. So if Landsec said, you know, we, we really don't want to be left behind, we're going to go, Frickin' all in, we're gonna put 80% of our portfolio asset strategy into not being left behind. Um, and we're gonna do this new thing. Um, uh, are you, would you be comfortable enough, if she was writing the check, to program and implement 80% of a landlord's portfolio? Do you think that the answer of what the market needs and what workplace should be is knowable yet? I mean, I, I think there's no end to it in the, the 80%, what, you know, is just a number where yeah. we're, we're gonna, we continue to grow, we continue to work with multiple landlords um, and, you know, it, it would make no difference, not that Landsec would do that, because I'm sure that they would do uh, as much of it as possible in-house, but, and it's not, you know, 80% is an interesting number because that's, I think that's exactly what GPE have recently said that they're right targeting, which is a massive move over to, to flex. I don't know whether it's as high as that, not putting words into their mouth. But, um, but it's, it's, it's just a number for us, right? So we are, we continue to grow, we continue to operate with multiple landlords. I mean, the, the, the beauty for us is that uh, the vision, as I think Will said earlier, the vision for every landlord is always slightly different, right? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the interesting thing for us because if you're just doing a cookie cutter, yeah. if you're not thinking about the history and the heritage of the building, if you're not got a specific vision for that building based on its location and quality, then it just, it just, it just won't work, right? And you'll just end up with a, a pretty bog standard product that people won't have any affiliation with or won't have any brand association with or, or value attached to and they'll be using it purely because they can access multiple buildings in a, in a network which I think is is actually r overrated. I think one of the one of the central notions I'm, I'm poking at and, and I think all three of you ha will have a unique perspective I know firsthand over on the occupier side that that enterprise real estate leaders, the people that used to write the check to you, um, are paralyzed. Not 100%, but, but, but there's enormous congestion in the leasing flow. They're, they're fearful of making the wrong decision. Everyone would like the clear answer, the vetted, proven answer to be before them so that they could act with confidence. Um, is there that same congestion or paralysis due to uncertainty constraining, oh, we'll start with you, Natasha. Are, 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 is Landsec feeling cautious about not being left behind? Or how, or how, how far into its journey of learning what the future wants uh, do you feel that you are? Are you ready to say, we've got it figured out where, where we can now scale this thing into production? Can we scale our Mayo flexible office? Yeah, into yes. Um, that, so that, think, that class of assets. Yeah, there's loads of questions you've got in there. So, you know, can, can we see the future? Well, no, because for each customer, yeah. their journey is going to be completely different. Yeah. Their employees are going to want different, you know, versions of hybrid. They're going to be thinking about different locations. They're going to be thinking of different solutions. So, w what is the one future? I think the one future, there's no such thing. I think we have to be diverse and try as a landlord to, you know, catch and provide right. the right spaces as best we can using all of our knowledge and all of our experience and all of the learning that we're seeing happening within our portfolio um, to get those spaces right and there'll be you know some that will excel and you know some will be a harder journey um, 
it's not new. Developers have to develop spaces that people want to use and occupy. That's not new. Yeah. Yeah. It's just perhaps our expectations of what our experience in the office is going to be on a daily basis has changed because yeah. we've been at home in the last two years completely to our own comfort levels, to our own experiences, our own tolerances. We've changed through that. And as yeah. we come back into the office, yeah, there's a thousand well, opinions, whereas once we used to conform. So, right. mm. well, in, in the last panel, uh, noted. Thank yeah. you. Um, in the last panel, Charlie Morris from Avis and Young made a comment. You know, we, you know, we need uh, agile suites as as Avis and Young has branded them, or you know, team suites, spec suites, the, you know, the, the team space for for a group of 20 or more people. And then he also said, and we also need the on-demand by the hourly space. Like, you know. Those are radically different yeah. products and customer experiences and build outs. Yeah. I mean, radically different. And, and how um, you actually, how we as developers actually deliver that within the one building, within right. the one campus, is the direction of travel for Landsec. So the wider team I sit in right. is very much looking at that. Right. So any new developments coming down the line, with looking at thinking, well, what amenities are going in here? Who's, who they're going to be available to, yeah. how many of the products, how much is going to be flex, how much is going to be fitted, how much is going to be blank canvas, what else do we need to add into the mix? And that's yeah. just a continual evolution and it's working with the right designers, asking the right people, speaking to our customers right. and trying to get it right each time. But like you say, it's a risk because you're fixing that, yeah. your ideas on that development and delivering it and seeing how it works. Thank you. I think, I think the, the issue that we have or the you know, owners have is to sit still is the status quo, and it's easy to do. If you're an asset manager, you're a fund manager, to sit still and do what you've always done and then blame the market is easy. And I'm not criticizing fund managers and asset managers. If you decide as an asset manager you're gonna take the step and go and spend money either on a Cat A plus fit out or bring an operator in a management agreement and it doesn't work, you've just put your job at risk. If you sit still and do what you've always done, and blame the market, it's easy to do. So I think there's a, yeah. a, another point going back to where you were with, 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 with Rupert with regard to 80% of your portfolio, for example. I keep going on about the right operator with the right asset. Mm -hmm. Every asset has to be looked at differently, whether it's location, whether it's quality of product, as you mentioned earlier on, how an operator fits in with that, or how the flex space, or even how the Cat A plus fits with that, that's key. <coughs> Rupert, what if that's completely wrong? What he just said. What, what if? Uh, what if they're both <laughs> missing the point? What if they're both he missing the wrong. point entirely? Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, it would be. What if it's about the customer and the customer isn't who the customer used to be? What if it's about the customer experience and the customer is actually the employee? And there's a journey that, with all due respect, they've never really thought about because they were signing a lease for ten years with some empowered uh, real estate manager. So, uh, take us through customer journey. Is that? Is yeah. that a relevant topic to the world that they want to be a part of? Yeah, definitely. I, I, I think ultimately, like Will says, they're, they're always different. And I think the landlords have got to play with it a little bit, right? And it will depend on the building. It will depend on the location. It will depend on lots of different things. But ultimately, um, whether you are a short-term tenant, what people call flex, I suppose, or you are a long-term tenant or a lessee, um, ultimately, you want, if you're in a grade A building or class A building, you want the ultimate level of service and quality, both to enhance uh, hybrid working, mm -hmm. but also to attract your employees. Yeah. Right? So if you think about those as kind of macro consequences that you are dealing with right now, particularly with you know, getting people back to the, the office, with some of the economic stats around the low uh, unemployment and therefore some of the, the strength that employees have, um, as well as just the sort of general like cost liability that you want to remove as a CFO of a business and use more amenity, um, you're going to have to play the you're going to have to play the game, right? And if you're looking at that, why not look at everything else that they're asking for? Why not listen to what people are asking for? Why not look at what the market is doing? Why not see who's doing it well and who's doing it badly? And obviously, those that actually put the customer first. And this isn't obviously a real estate algorithm, that's any business, uh, succeed, right? So what is it that customers want? They want a phenomenal journey. They want people who care. They don't want to be told no. They want really good service. They want a mix of kind of food and beverage, essentially. They want on-demand stuff. They want it bloody easy. Um, and they want it to be, uh, you know, um, all done in, in like quick time. Um, 
And I think that's where operators are, you know, good, right? They are, they are, you know, really good because actually it's not about tenants where you just squeeze into a space and ask for a check every quarter and then, um, and then never see them again and they, they don't notice the leak gushing through. Um, it's actually much more about the customer journey and what they want on a data. It's much more like hotels, if you like. Yeah. I yeah. hate that expression, but the hotelification. Oh. Horrible, but that's what it is kind of getting to. It's about the consumerization. It's good, yeah, better. It's, it's sounds, too yeah. sounds, sounds way too McKinsey, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, uh, there's no McK anybody? McKinsey here? No. Okay. Um, uh, I've been at this sort of way too long, and I'm not a real estate guy, full disclosure. Um, but, but in the 15 year sweep or so of me mucking about in this realm, this isn't the first time I've heard from the landlord community sort of a, a, a wave of change. I mean, there, there was the amenitization wars that were raging you know, in the years before the pandemic. And uh, if I go back 15 years, it was the marble in the lobby. You gotta revamp the lobby so that we project a great brand. And then and more recently, mm -hmm. you know, four to five years ago, it was, I see you nodding, uh, it was the, the gyms or the, or the yoga room. I kind of feel like it's, you're, you're, you're still smiling. I kind of feel like some it's of those what you're about waves of amenitization wars miss the mark. Like the, the gyms are sitting mostly empty. I mean, pre-pandemic they were. Like our, um, how is this gonna be different than, how will this round of new capitalization to create better experiences that are customer centric, how are you gonna get it right this time? Are you gonna get it? Well, what's the metric for Right, what do you mean by right? Well, I imagine it would be share right. price for Landsec or economic occupancy of a building or, or not having to give the keys back to a lender as Chris predicted and others have. Um, mm. So survival, how about that first? Um, um, I'm gonna answer a slightly different question. Please, because that was a shit question. <laughs> take, yeah, take it away. Just make it up. Yeah. 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 I do. Answer the question you wanted to be asked. There, yeah. No, I'm, I was just listening to what you, you were saying about these waves of change, right. but people aren't static and we continue to change and grow. And if you think that people are at the center of using these buildings, and what I would say our shift has been is thinking less about leasing to the company and more about the end user experience, that individual is now front of mind in the way we design our spaces and how they're going to be used. And, and therefore, if you build around individuals or try and capture any common experiences and allow for differences, and I think that's the layer up you know, what do you want when you walk into yeah. an office? Do you want the big marble cathedral? Do you want human spaces? Do you want, you know, as we change, we're always going to be changing real estate because we're meeting new needs as we develop them. And so I, I don't think that we miss the mark. I think right. in completely in contrast, I think we're continually renewing and trying to deliver that experience. What about... Um... Okay. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Come on. Start it up. Um, what about like this? Thing? So all of this is about people, right? And um, people and customer journey and people making money and people having a good time and yeah. people, 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 which mm -hmm. we love. Um, and therefore, what about brand, like um, affiliation to a building brand, for example, versus mm -hmm. non-affiliation? Because I always think, here he goes, I always think, um, You've got, to, you've got to feel like, so, so for example, no one probably writes um, uh, uh, startup.com, tech space, 26 Luke Street, or wherever we are. They? they would just put 26 Luke Street, or do, does this building have a brand? I mean, I notice this event space has a different brand, but I don't know whether this has a brand. But like, do, do you know what I mean? And, th and therefore, they feel like they're part of something that's actually a little bit of theirs, and therefore, what does that actual brand stand for, and therefore, can people get on board with that? And that's a little bit intangible, a little bit brandy, a little bit marketing. But um, I actually think there's something in that, because I think we're all people that want something that's a little bit different, and eventually customer journey isn't necessarily gonna be that differential after a while. We're, we're, we're in five years time, we're all gonna be in like the hotelification of, uh, of uh, commercial buildings, but maybe the differential is in brand. What do we think about that, discuss? Um, I think, I think it's two things. I think that perhaps brand where you're, it, it fosters a kind of a reliance and an expectation and a trust 
in, you know, say Mayo, powered by Landsec, that we're going mm. to deliver you a quality yep. that, you know, we're going to be delivering sustainability and ESG and a, and a level of service and all of those kind of things. I think a brand can go to an extent there. Yep. Um, you're talking a little bit about kind of the reflected glory of this standout trophy that I can feel excited because I yeah. work in the Gherkin or I work in the Shard or something like that. Um, I think I think the thing is with um, Flex, because it is customer-centric, people orientated, the whole operation is re it's, it's in the operations. You know, that's that's the business. It's the ops. That's, yeah. that's what you're buying. You're buying the service. You're buying people that care that they're delivering, that they're prioritizing you. And I think that once, I think that's where your experience is really coming from, less so the, the building or the brand, I would, I'd hate to say. It's really not about the name above the door. It's really about the experience you have on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, I don't think that like a homogenized brand across is, is really going to have that reflected glory because once you, sometimes it can work against you because when it's everywhere, what well, does it I, mean? I think I completely agree with that. I actually agree with both points, but I think we've got a situation where we keep talking about it, the occupier will decide. Yeah. So if you, you've built your business based on your brand and what you stand for and how you want to go about it. There's gonna be other operators out there and owners out there that have built a building and they believe in that building, but they don't want to dilute that by having a, a brand that doesn't sit with them or, or, or is not white labeled. And I think ultimately the occupier is the one that's gonna be sitting there and saying, I want to be affiliated with X and Y. I want to be affiliated with X, Y, Z. <laughs> whoever, whomever else, see them there. Um, but I mean, we end up in a situation where, and going back to my point about right operator, right asset, it is literally about what you don't want to be doing is trying to force feed a brand into a building or into a location, mm. geographically or an asset, that, that ultimately doesn't work with that asset, that doesn't work with the owner, and therefore doesn't work with the, the occupier. So we are in a situation that we have to flow. We have, you, I know for a fact, do not, choose every building. Unlike me, who follows every check, you will say, <laughs> that building is not for me. So actually, we end up in a situation that you've chosen with your brand not to damage your brand or put it at risk by choosing the assets you go for. Mm. Now, I will come to you with a building and say, would you be interested in this? And you might say, yeah, that fits our brand. So I think we've got to be I'd agree with that. very careful how we go about using brand and what brand stands for and, and everything else. But the occupier ultimately will decide. Okay, quick speed round. Two questions, rapid fire on this, on this topic. Uh, postcard from the future, it's 10 years from now. We'll start here. Um, what percentage of flex supply in this 10 year from now future, or five years, five years from now, because it's happening fast. Five years from now, what percentage of flex capacity supporting work from where it works, work from anywhere, will be uh, provided by landlords versus serviced office operators? I think in five years, five years times too short. I think How much percentage will be wise, answer the question. Answer. Five years, five years. Uh, the whole flex market, uh, I'd have said about thirty percent. Okay, Natasha. Five years from now, how big? Of, what what percentage of the whole pie will landlords be uh, of the of the flex operations and execution? I don't. I think you're quickly. Optimistic. I know. So do I. I had no time Maybe to 20. think. You've now got time. <laughs> I'm right. and, well, the, the correct answer is twenty-five. <laughs> <laughs> I swear. So all three of you are agreeing that uh, landlords will be significantly more, but not the majority? Yeah. OK. All right. Of that average 25% that landlords are fulfilling, second, second of two, uh, what percentage of that uh, landlord flex supply will be brands like Mayo that are, that are landlord stood up, you know, the branded landlord versus uh, you know, so an X plus Y? If they're providing uh, their operated. own space, if yeah. they're providing that physically without an operator, I suspect 100% of it. So you think landlords will, are, 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 right? Yeah. They were, what landlords, 100% of? Well, they will have their own brand if they've, if they've decided to go down oh, that right, road to okay. provide themselves. Yeah. Um, 100%. Yeah, right. no, I'd, I'd say much lower. OK. I, I, I don't know, 10, 20 Oh. Yeah, Jeez. I do feel. Yeah, there are so many caveats, but you've got a quick fire answer. So yeah. um, I'd say 30%. Now can I caveat? No. Please. No. Yeah. Uh, well, but here's the kind, like, no. I, Perhaps we've all heard this, but I, I we, you know, I, I, I do often revert back to thinking about the hospitality industry, the Marriotts and the Hiltons of the world, as a proxy for what this might look like. Mm. That they, they might be 30 years down the maturation path from where we are, and we know where that ended up. You know, Marriott used to own hotels, but they don't anymore. They own, you know, the dominant flag. 
but there are multiple flags out there. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm, so that was on my mind when I asked the speed yeah. question. Will, will, will landlords evolve and will the future ideal model be something different than where hotels have ended up, where the hospitality world has? You got, your impulses seem to suggest that yes, that landlords would be standing up, or Will, you said. Well, I, I, I just think that we're in a situation that in five years' time, if you're an owner starting the Flex World, you will want to brand that. You want to say, actually, we're doing something very different right. to the norm. Yeah. Maybe 10, 15 years down the line, I think it'll be a lot less. Right. But I think immediately people will say, actually, like Landsec have done, like British Land have done, to say, we've got a brand. Yeah. Look at us. Actually, it differentiates our product between our traditional and our Flex. Uh -huh. But British Land would have a, a different opera. They wouldn't always have story in it. No, the, but they have to, again, story have to fight for that space as well. So they pitch for this yeah. place. She, so they, she used to market story at British Land. Is that true? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. What about, would Landsec do ever do a different operator? Would they always go with Maya? Because uh, it's a bit of a different product, <clears throat> isn't it? It is. And I suppose when Maya was created, um, we had majority London or Southeast office portfolio. Now, through the acquisition of you and I, we've got um, holdings in Leeds and Manchester and Glasgow and we're looking at how do you repurpose re uh, our retail assets and is there a play there? And right. you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity and I would agree that perhaps we wouldn't place Mayo in every yeah. location um, or perhaps we would do a, a version of Mayo, I don't know. But uh, there's no way we would say we wouldn't have um, an agreement with somebody, we just don't at the moment. Because someone like... Um uh, a Landsec or a, or a British land, they're not buying buildings and developing buildings with Flex in mind. They're obviously developing it. With GPR. Uh, with GPR. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or, they, or didn't. And therefore, like, when they get to it, it might not work within that mm. building that they've developed or created or built. And therefore, yeah, floor plates. But, but exactly. Plates, and therefore, yeah. but, but there is still a requirement for right. this Flex, and therefore, they but might I do think somewhere. you will see development with Flex in mind, mind in the future. Oh, definitely, I yeah, do. Yeah. And I think it might have, talk about your yeah. the floor plates. How much is that going to affect values of buildings? That when you when people come to buy them that are VP or whatever it's else, the they can the sit room. there and say, well, actually, I, I don't think I can get all my products in here. I want to have traditional, I want to have Cat A+, yeah, yeah. I want to have Flex. Yeah. It doesn't work. So actually, I'm going to walk yeah, on yeah. by. Yeah. Um, mindful of time, and we are at time. Um, I'd like to... Uh, Reference Simon, who I think was on the first panel this morning, and, and you very generously said, um, "Hey, we need to share data. We want to share." You 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 put yourself out there and and, and uh, opened your front door. <laughs> oh. So we've got um, uh, to the to our esteemed uh, panelists. We've got I think something like 500 people that are purportedly watching this right now, and it's being recorded. Oh. Wave to the camera, everyone. And so there's going to be a, a you know a half life to this. So to that end, and inspired by Simon. Uh, each of you, please, uh, Will, if you'd start, well, um, tell talking. us again who you are and, and are you, uh, are you, uh, is your door open? Uh, and, and would you like the audience <laughs> to seek you out for, uh, if, if they're inspired by what they heard in this recording? Oh, yeah. yeah. If, if I haven't made it clear enough already, I will accept money from anybody. <laughs> <laughs> There's staff up there, anybody. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. And Natasha, uh, Landsec, uh, can people come and learn from what you're learning? And yeah. are you uh, are you open for business to be to, to be chatted with, whether it's, whether it's on LinkedIn or email or what have you? Definitely, I think that's yeah. how we arranged got got to here and have our own product is because yeah. we went out and learned from yeah. people like Simon. So absolutely. I, I, I was just recalling how we had a beer seven years ago. No, oh, yeah, seven. Oh, sorry, just beer. Five years ago. Recently. Five years ago, and where I basically um, pulled his brain apart for my old business model. Um, <laughs> So he was very influential in, in me deciding to, to go, or us deciding to go and do X and Y. And likewise, I would always uh, speak and, and talk to anybody that was interested. I'd tell them not to do it. But, um, <laughs> but for those that, that were interested, I, I definitely, yeah, the door is always open for sure. Super. Well, I, I agree with Chris's, Chris Early's comment earlier. It, it's, um, we are in a period of great change. It's, it's going to take a village. It's going to take uh, all of these parts working uh, perhaps in co-opetition, but it, 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 we, we are all a part of the answer. So uh, thank you for your comments and your generosity. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Around. Thank you. Well, then, really. Thank you. Yeah. I think we're done. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, there's some yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, well.
I just wanted to differentiate between landlord operators and operators who take on leases or management agreements. I'm a landlord operator. We operate our own, a uh, very small version of, of LandSex. The, the ones who take leases or management agreements have to make a profit beyond the rack rent. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Yeah. My concern is big landlords like Mayo, who maybe, sorry, uh, LandSex, who maybe realize that they have to produce or have to, to provide flex as part of the offering because that's the way it's going. Are you going to be looking to extract from your flex operations a, a, a greater EBITDA than a rack rent, or are you going to be satisfied with actually you, you know, getting the yield from your building as though you were rack renting it? In which case, you could be the death of people like Rupert, eventually. Well, I'd hate to be the death of you, Rupert. That's the first. Not, not this yeah, I'd, week, like, anyway. I'd like to say that. Straight and just for out. clarification, when you, yeah, the, 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 the we might be going. And for the, and for the for the panel and the audience, when you say rack rate, are you are you referring to the the ten year lease? Standard lease. lease. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, landlords want a standard lease. Yeah. We have to extract right. more profit than a standard lease. Otherwise, no point doing it. Yes. Mm. Well, I can't answer for all landlords, but the way we are doing is part of the appeal of Landsat creating its own brand to coming into the flex world is to actually experience that enhanced income profile. So I think we are probably holding ourselves to the same standards, and I know not every landlord is going to do the same, but there is that confidence that at least we are hitting our ERVs and our expectations and, you know, void savings. So there are advantages to us um, of doing our own, but we are in it for the enhanced income profile. So I hope that. That's good to hear. Yeah, I, hope I hope you can put hope pressure on the RICs to value that extra income. That's the next step, isn't it? I, I, think, yeah. I think the key is, though, that, again, going back to the point, every asset is different. And I'm, seeing, I'm working with owners now that aren't looking for that rack rent return. They believe that the flex products, the occupier ability to, sorry, the ability to uh, appeal to all occupiers doesn't need to make rack rent back because they'll see it elsewhere in the building. They'll see the opportunity to bring people down from upstairs, take smaller spaces, be more flexible, use um, spaces for expansion or contraction. So actually a lot of operators and owners now that I'm working with are sitting there and saying, actually, I'm not really bothered how much that makes us because I know it's going to enhance the building and therefore the value of the building elsewhere because of the lack of valuation on management agreements or serviced office space. It's almost a viewpoint of, well, if you can't value it, let's try and create value elsewhere. That's my point, Will. That, that'll undermine the value of, of uh, flex operations. But I, but, but by, I think... By, but nobody, we work by undercutting, you know... What, uh, absolutely, but I think you'll find up in a situation... That's only a short-term thing. Yeah. It's a short-term thing where they can sit there and say, because it doesn't, there's no value to it, if it adds value elsewhere, once valuation is sorted out, it'll add value elsewhere and it'll have its own valuation as well. So it's going to be a... It's yeah. almost a double bubble. It's a, it's a, it's a proper, you know, self-fulfilling, you know, prophecy in terms of... Yeah, you know, yeah, one day, one day. Satisfied with that answer? Thank you. Yeah? Yes, a bit scary, but yes. <laughs> um, any other questions from the audience before we uh, adjourn? Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thanks.